Even though a lot of fairy tales started out as eerie and grim kinds of stories, nowadays many of them are seen as just, like, cute little fun stories for kids. But I thought it would be kind of fun to take some characters from some of the most famous fairy tales and redesign them into epic warriors of legend. So, while I do those redesigns today, I'm gonna present new lore for these characters as well, and tell it through a conversation between two of my own original characters. Tayrin the Beast Chronicler, who narrates all of my dragon episodes, and Vasilia Kuznet, the armor crafter who narrates all my fantasy armor episodes. I think this is gonna be a really fun reinterpretation, so let's get into it, shall we? Let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. Vasilia, leaving your shop just now, was that... I mean, I, I know I have to be seeing things, but that woman looked just like... Like the great warrior Lilith the Red? I... yes, but that's obviously ridiculous. I know Lilith the Red is just a folktale, and even if she was real, she'd be, what, 500 years old by now? You are correct. Was not her. Was her great, 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 many, many times great granddaughter, Layla the Red. She carries on her family mission to hunt down werewolves who cause problems, which, you know, not to be wolfist, but is most werewolves. Many times she will not kill them though, just cure them with crystals from an emerald Tyrannus. Usually does trick. But... that... So Lilith the Red was real? My my sister used to tell me legends about her before bed, but I never imagined she was actually a real person. She was indeed, though many people get story wrong, so let me illuminate you about the real version. Oh, no, that's okay. I'm, I'm sure the story is pretty universal. You don't need to... No, no, I insist. I will tell again and you will enjoy the real version. Trust me. Lilith the Red lived in small village on island not far from where the Skylands float above the ocean. W wait, you know about the Skylands? I only found out about those a few months ago. Really? Maybe you need to hear even more of my stories than I thought. And maybe not interrupt them? Oh, that... Okay, uh, sorry. It's fine, I am just making silly with you, so serious. Now, Lilith the Red's island home had a forest that was plagued with cursed direwolves, and it was known that if you survived an attack from them but had been bitten, you would gain Curse of Werewolf. You'd transform on full moons, attack friends and family, smell like wet dog, you know, all the classic werewolf stuff. But, not all were afraid of the wolves. Lilith's grandmother was a recluse who left the village when Lilith was quite young to venture into woods to build a home there and live in solitude as some kind of old weird forest monk lady. Lilith grew up being told by her village that her grandmother was long dead. They believed you could not spend even an hour in woods without being devoured or turned into a werewolf who would then wreak havoc on the village. But. Her parents maintained that grandmother had lived, that she was a strong woman who could handle dire wolves and was likely living quiet, isolated life she desired. So one day, Lilith decided to prove her family had the grit to stand the woods. She swears to enter woods and not come out till she finds proof of her grandmother's survival, even dons full red cape, color known to attract dire wolves. That is how confident she is she can survive attack. She enters woods and over first night fends off nearly a dozen dire wolves without a scratch. But then is faced with a werewolf. Should have been impossible as was not the night of a full moon, but there it was all the same. Lilith fights creature for over an hour, taking many scratches but never getting bitten. That is until she was too exhausted to avoid it. Werewolf bit right into Lilith's waist, and she knew she would become a plague to her village the night of every full moon thereafter. Lilith was about to take her own life to protect them when Wolf before her transformed, at will, back into her grandmother. Grandmother explained she'd gained control over Wolf powers, and believed Lilith could do the same, but needed proof of her strength, which is why grandmother attacked her. Lilith's skills in the fight proved she was strong enough to become a muto lichen, one able to change at will and harness powers of a werewolf for good. After that, Grandmother stayed in woods, happy with her solitude, but Lilith returned home. She became protector of her village, using her wolfly might to slay any who attacked them, and eventually taking on task of hunting down any werewolves who proved unable to learn control over their transformations.
That actually was slightly different from the version I've heard. Is that how Lilith's descendants tell it? I assume so. Was actually the version I heard from my parents, but I'd say they have trustworthy take, as my family has been making armor for Lilith Thread's descendants for hundreds of years now, as we have for many younger generations of legendary warriors. Not to brag, but Kuznet family armors are somewhat stuff of legends themselves. Really? I actually didn't know your whole family had been making armors so long. What other legends are true? What other descendants have you made armors for? I love when people ask me for stories. I assume you've heard the tale of Jack the Stalksfire? That one can't possibly be true, can it? Our world doesn't have things like magic beans that give you powers. You literally have girlfriend from other world who has little metal friend attached to her arm that can become giant swords and weapons that shoot glowing light. How are you so skeptical of boy getting powers from beans? That is a good point. Every time I think my mind is as open as it can be, I realize I still have a hard time accepting that I've been so blind to how incredible our world is. Well, let me help you open that mind even further. Jack was from very poor family who had nothing but a dying cow and crumbling home in need of repair. Their home had been raided many times by passing bandits, and their kingdom's guard was so minuscule that they never had any protection. The king of their home lived in his palace atop a colossal tree that reached into the heavens. Some had tried to climb tree, but was very smooth and had bark as hard as steel, so it was not possible. Only way to get up or down was by dragon riding. Nobody in the village had such a creature, so they could never go up and request more assets for the kingdom's subjects. They were essentially on their own and helpless. Jack's mother instructed him to take out the market and trade it for as much building materials as he could get to repair their home. But on way through forest, he came across a shaman who claimed that Jack finding him was no accident, that it had been his fate to meet the shaman and trade his cow to the man for a set of magical beans. He claimed these beans when planted would create massive beanstalk that would reach all the way to top of tree. Shaman was too old and weathered to climb, but Jack could climb to confront the useless king. I always heard it was giants that lived above his home, and they'd throw stuff down on his village and that's how his home was damaged. Giants? No, this is silly. How is that more silly than magic beans and a castle on a giant unclimbable tree? Giants don't like being in high places, they're already so tall as it is. Although, apparently the king was quite fat. So sort of a giant, just giant in wide way, not giant in tall way. Anyway, Jack makes trade, but instead of planting beans, Jack consumes beans. He thinks magic is magic, and he wants power of magic to use as he pleases. At first, does nothing. He goes home, tells mother what happened, and she is mad he was so reckless about consuming magical beans. Wait. She just accepted that the beans were magic? Yes, magic used to be quite abundant in this world. It was only in the last hundred years or so it became more rare to see in daily life. Wonder whose fault that was, huh? I say sarcastically. Anyway, the next day Jack wakes up surrounded by plants and foliage in his room. He soon realizes beans gave him power to control plant life. Much better than just making big beanstalk once. He uses power to make dozens of beanstalks. Whole kingdom is rallied and climbs to King's home to confront him about the turmoil of the villages. King tries to have his guards kill all the intruders, but they fight back, until Jack orders them to retreat to the stalks. They follow orders and Jack shrinks the massive tree the castle is atop until the King's home is on ground level, like the rest of them. Seems like he probably could have just done that in the first place. True, but he was young boy, maybe it took him time to think of that. Anyway, King soon sees how hard it is living down there, and spends much of his fortune to hire proper kingdom guards, and help rebuild homes of his subjects. Jack is then after seen as hero, and all his descendants since have inherited his powers. And of course, have always entrusted the cool nets to don them in attire that suits their abilities. Wait a minute, how does your family know so many of these legendary lineages personally? 
Many of these legends are from all over the world, aren't they? Yes, but the Kuznets have lived on many continents over the years. Each generation sets up shop in a new land. We haven't always met original person from a legend, just met descendants who inevitably come seeking our armors when we've lived in their regions. So, have your ancestors met any of the original people these tales are about? I am so very glad you asked that question, because yes. Zashit Nick, bring me the necklace on my bedside, would you? Who is Zashi- By the Titan of Death, did you actually manage to train a squirrel to do your bidding? What, you doubted I could? Such little faith you have! Uh, thank you, Zashit Nick. Now see the claw on the end of this necklace? Is from a great Norwegian mountain bear. Oh, wow, that's the toughest species of bear in the Northern Hemisphere. And I'm guessing your family was given it by the great Viking Goldbraith? Very clever guess, Theron. Was left over after my ancestor made her armor adorned with the paw of a bear she'd slain. Goldbraid was from traversing tribe of warriors who were revered for being unbeatable. Children were raised from age three to wield weapons, and yet, when they came across a region abundant in mountain bears, they soon found the creature to be too much, even for them. The head of the clan himself was killed and they fled the mountain now needing to appoint a new head. Somehow, before they could, word spread to other tribes that they had finally been bested, even if it was by vicious bears. Some other tribes were discussing uniting to finally wipe out Goldbraith's tribe, and she was not having it. She was embarrassed her people had been disgraced, so, despite still being young warrior, she set off to hunt down a mountain bear on her own to prove her people were not slipping in strength. She searched the mountains until she came across a cave. Inside were no bears, but was a recent kill, a dead Nordic thunder dragon. A de- Wait, I understand these bears are strong, but do you really believe they could kill a dragon that mighty? Eh, I was not going to say, but even I am skeptical of that part of the story. Maybe they found one dead or already wounded, but it was there to be sure. Anyway, Goldbraith lit fire and cooked part of Dragon, eating it herself, believing she could gain its strength from doing so. Not sure if she actually did, but she was incredibly mighty warrior, so who knows? Apparently, she even nearly dozed off waiting for the bears to return, but soon enough, they did arrive. A whole family of them. She slayed the mother and father and was going to be merciful and let the young one live, until it attacked her as well. She slayed it too, then skinned one, bringing the hide back to her village to prove her kill. They then sent a band back to the cave to retrieve the rest, and placed the heads at the lead of their caravan, so all who spotted them would now know that the tribe could best any creature, even the vicious mountain bears. And Goldbraith was made the new clan head, right? Yes. Her clan then passed through the village my ancestor had set up shop in, and he crafted part of the creature's hide into an armor for her. It's said that in that armor she was even able to slay a Nordic Longtail. I don't have as much proof of this being true, but donned in a Kuznet original armor, I certainly believe it is possible. You suddenly seem somewhat distracted. Is this the case? Oh, sorry, I, I was just looking at... Uh, what did you call it? Zashitnik? I'm just surprised a squirrel is so willing to wear that armor that you made it. What, you've never seen animal in armor? You know, it is not the first time one in my family has made armor for small creature. You ever heard the story of the assassin frogs? Th that one's true too? I didn't realize humans with animal transformation abilities were so common. I mean, I've come across a few werewolves and some people with anthroposis. And of course, there's my friend Astra who can turn into a dragon, but she's not from this world. But a frog? Oh wait, you can't think of anyone else you know who transforms into a different humanoid animal? Like say, I don't know, a jaguar? Well, I don't think so. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, forget I said anything. Anyway, assassin frogs are indeed true story. 
Though we have not been in touch for a few generations, my ancestors did make wares for their granddaughter. She told the story of how her grandmother was princess who hated her life in palace. She would leave as often as she could, always venturing into more and more dangerous places. Even once running off into swamp, known for being hiding place of thieves avoiding arrest. While venturing through, she was attacked by group of bandits. She defended herself okay, but there were many of them and she was not particularly well trained in combat then. Luckily. Someone else jumped in to help. I'm assuming you meant to put a heavy emphasis on jumped? Ah! Yes, I, I did not even do that on purpose. Very good, Darren. A frog who wielded daggers jumped in and slayed all her attackers, then introduced himself. He was a thief who'd stolen from a witch, but been caught, and she cursed him to be a small humanoid frog for the rest of his days. But. He had quickly embraced it and enjoyed the stealthy nature of his size. After conversing for only a few hours, she fell head over heels for Frog. She asked him to take her to the witch that had done this to him. He did so and the princess offered her mountain of gold if she granted the princess the power to change into small humanoid Frog as well and gave Frog men ability to change back and forth. Which did not like Small Frogman for having stolen from her, but the amount of gold offered was far too large to refuse. Woman did as instructed and the princess fled her home to elope with the Frogman. He trained her to be an assassin as well and they lived out their days as the slimiest and most successful mercenaries for hire in all the land. And of course, all their children were born with the same power to transform. And eventually our families crossed paths and we made weapons and armors suited for their small size. Wow, that's... I can't believe these stories are all true. It just really is so incredible to know that... Hey, I'm a lady, you ready to come meet the big old grump himself? Hey, Tyrin, what a quinky dink, what are you doing here? You getting the sword that doesn't just push people away really hard? Because I feel like you could use that. Benny? What are you doing? You know Vasilia? Yeah, I met a... Oh, wait a sec. Am I a week early? I am a week early, ain't I? I'm such a goon when it comes to calendars. Vasilia, I'll see you in a week, yeah? You're still coming to see some of my mech armors I done built, right? Yes, indeed. I believe we'll be quite interesting. What is going on here? That could be my new favorite Fantasy Armor episode. I really like how all of the art turned out, and it's really fun writing the lore for episodes as banter between two different characters. Which, by the way, I've made a new playlist that's specifically filled with all the episodes where I have two narrators bantering back and forth to explain the lore stories for an episode. Because I've been doing more of those lately, and I have a bunch more planned coming up. And of course, if you're new to the channel and you want more episodes like this, I've already got a bunch of different Fantasy Armor and Fantasy Night episodes, and I'll just link the whole playlist in the cards, because I think they're all pretty equally good. By the way, I've made a single poster from this episode with all four of these drawings on it. It's on my online store, link is in the description. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or uplifting note. And the thought I want to leave people with today is the idea that you owe it to yourself to stop overthinking what could happen and just start enjoying what does happen. Love a good simple one that speaks for itself. Thanks so much for watching everybody. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode on Friday. Goodbye.